Good morning, everyone, on this suspicious day when Israel goes to the polls and I have to deal with the Allies and the Holocaust. But my paper has a somewhat different focus because this is a subject that I have come to initially from the direction of research, international socialism, and its crimes. And 30 years ago, I published a book called in English, Hitler's Apocalypse, in which I had to deal for the first time with one of the core issues that I want to examine today, namely the underlying ideology of anti-Semitism, which inspired uh, Hitler and the Nazi regime. And I think it's essential to grasp some fundamentals about this issue before we come to the question of how, in particular, the three leading Allied statesmen during World War II responded to the plight of the Jews. And I will come to them subsequently. The first point I'd like to make regarding Hitler and his concept of the Jewish question is that in contrast to all the other main protagonists, and this is a huge difference, from the outset of his political career, he saw the struggle or the war against the Jews as an absolute core element of his worldview. It was, in fact, as he constantly called it in German, a Weltanschauungskampf, a struggle of worldviews. This is not a simple, straightforward case of xenophobia, not even of racism or biological racism. It's not simply an offshoot of German ultranationalism, as it was often mistakenly perceived in the West. I think Hitler's anti-Semitism and that of the leading cadre of the National Socialist Movement in Germany really was something else. And that from the outset, it was an entire philosophy of history, of society, of culture, with, of course, very concrete political implications. The Jews were literally perceived, and this is something that I don't think any of the other leaders in World War II could ever possibly grasp. It was actually perceived as being the key to the outcome of history and the battle of civilization. It was an existential struggle for Hitler. It represented the Jewish question, represented the most fundamental ontological anxiety of the German people. That was the take on it. And I don't think it ever deviated at any point. So the enemy was defined as world Jewry. That too is important. Das Welt Judentum. And this world Jewry included, therefore, the dispersed, the worldwide Jewish people went far beyond the Jews of Germany. That was always clear and should have been clear from the beginning. But it had a much more far-reaching, seemingly abstract, um, metaphysical element almost, because 
Jews, Judaism, Jewishness, everything that included the word Yiddish was at the same time a symbol and a metaphor and a code for all other enemies, not just of Hitler and the Nazi movement, but of Germany, of Europe, of the white race. Almost everything that goes under the heading of liberalism, of parliamentarism, bourgeois democracy, of course, Marxism, pacifism, humanitarian concerns, and Judeo-Christianity. So this is the meaning of the struggle against the Jews, which I don't think that Churchill, Roosevelt, Stalin, let alone many of the other heads of state or decision makers really could get their hands around. This is operating at a different level of categories altogether. When Hitler says to Hermann Rauschning in the early 1930s, remember that the struggle with the territorial struggle, great powers, all of this is just illusion, facade. Because behind England, behind America, behind France, stands Israel. Or when, in the well-documented protocol of the meeting between Hitler and Haj Amin al-Husseini, leader of the Palestine Arab National Movement, at the end of November 1941, he repeats in slightly different language the same idea. He's deadly serious about it. That is actually his worldview. He says seemingly, outwardly, this world war is a struggle between the capitalism of England and the communism of the Soviet Union on one side and the National Socialist we on the other side. But that's not so. That's superficial. The real Weltanschauungskampf is between us and the Jews. And I think this is something that was literally incomprehensible to the allies. I called it 30 years ago apocalyptic anti-Semitism on the grounds that the World War was always considered as being an apocalyptic final struggle, an end camp uh, from Hitler's perspective. With regard to Russia, uh, this was particularly clear because very early on, 1919, 1920, you can see that the Nazi movement, influenced by people like Alfred Rosenberg and the Baltic exiles, has a certain perception of Bolshevism and the seizure of power in Soviet Russia as being the dramatic manifestation of a Jewish drive for world domination. And that the National Socialist Movement has been called into being, so to speak. Its historic destiny is either to defeat this Jewish bid for world domination or to go under, to become extinct. And the extinction of Germany would mean the end of Europe and what we sometimes call the West. 
Later in the speech of January 1939, 20 years later, after the beginning, beginnings of the movement in the Reichstag, the speech so often commented, where Hitler provides an either or to the German people and to the world. He talks about there can only be one outcome if and when the Jews will plunge the world into another world war. Either the result will be the Bolshevization of the earth, which would mean the victory of Judaism, supposedly, or the destruction of the Jewish race in Europe. Those are the words, Vernichtung der jüdischen Rasse in Europa. In other words, an apocalyptic prophecy, which of course Hitler then set about step by step implementing. So here we have at one level the initiator, the progenitor of the world war with that kind of an agenda. And there we have Roosevelt and Churchill and Stalin, each in their own way, who are operating on a completely different level and with the notions concerning the Jews that are at least initially totally remote from any of this. And I think this, this is part, part of the trouble. When Hitler thinks of Roosevelt, for example, and after all, their terms in office coincide exactly 1933 to 45 in very different political systems. What he sees, and particularly after 1941, that becomes self-evident, is that the man in the White House is the tool of the Jews. Nazi propaganda endlessly regurgitates, and, and this is so ironic in terms of what we know that Roosevelt did not do for the Jews. endlessly rehearsing the long list of Jewish advisors, people around him who were controlling and manipulating Roosevelt. Some of them were real names, people who did have some influence, Morgenthau, Rosenman. But there's a long list, La Guardia, you know, whether they were Jews, half Jews, doesn't really matter, Bloom, Cohen, Frankfurter, and so on and so on. What was important here is that Roosevelt was perceived, his actions were perceived as the machinations of the international Jewish plutocracy. They were a manifestation of the Jewish urge to imperial domination. The United States represents, certainly from 1941, when uh, German efforts uh, to keep America out of the war are no longer operative. That is the perception, but let's remember, if you look at Hitler's speech declaring war, which is after all what he did on the United States on the 11th of December 1941, you can see that this is something he actually seems to rejoice in. He's going to meet his destiny now. It's quite an exultant speech. And this line about uh, the United States, but also Great Britain, as being essentially the straw men of the Jews in their drive to secure and achieve uh, world domination. That is echoed and repeated word for word in Arabic uh, 
on Berlin radio over four years by Hajamin and other leading propagandists of Arab nationalism, word for word. Same perception, same categories. The straw men of the Jews, blinded by Jewish influence. And this brings me to the perception that Hitler had of the Western powers, the Western allies. I think this was a fairly consistent view after 1933 that he was dealing with an Anglo-Saxon, it's particularly true of the perception of Britain, a decadent Anglo-Saxon elite. He had hopes and he persisted with them, perhaps up until the summer of 1940, that he could come to an agreement with Great Britain, a kind of division of the world between the British Empire and the greater German hegemony throughout the European continent. He thought this was a generous deal that he was offering the British, particularly after World War II began and the early success, military successes of the Nazis. And I think this was one of the great disappointments with considerable implications for Hitler. Churchill, in his eyes, was obviously one of the prime culprits. But again, Churchill was perceived ultimately as another straw man of the Jews. He was their man because this elite in Britain, which should have been eager to seize the day, ally itself with the rising energetic power of their Germanic cousins, had betrayed their racial destiny. And here again, it was, it was a Judaized England, which had con had acted contrary to the interests of the race. So that the war with England, the refusal of England to accept defeat in May 1940 and subsequent peace offer, this, I think, confirmed, if any confirmation was necessary at all, just how powerful Jewish influence was. It's interesting in this context to read the diaries of Joseph Goebbels. There is a remark I remember when I first uh, began to examine this issue. It really stuck in my throat. Goebbels' comment in 1941 that he's convinced, he believes, that the English and the Americans are secretly pleased by the, the way that we are eliminating, annihilating this riffraff. It's a pretty sickening comment, perhaps not surprising from someone like Goebbels, certainly reflects this kind of cynicism. Yet when we look at the record today, there is certainly an uncomfortable feeling. Not that this was true, literally, in the, uh, certainly not in the terms that uh, Goebbels put it, but that after all, from 
their perspective, that indeed is how it might look, that they were actually being given some kind of a free hand to wipe out the Jewish people in Europe without in any way this being the response did not give the sense that this was an issue um, over which any major resources or even thought or energy or plans, policy, would be invested. Of course, and here's another irony, when Goebbels comes to mention the Allied Declaration in December 1942, the one and only time throughout World War II that the Allies make a very public statement of some real import acknowledging what today we would call the final solution, of course not in all its details, what was known then, but it's quite clear even from that declaration with all its omissions, it's clear enough that the Germans have embarked upon a planned systematic program of annihilating the Jews of Europe, of assembling them from different countries, bringing them to Poland, and Anthony Eden, British Foreign Secretary, makes this declaration in the House of Commons in London, and this again was unprecedented, has to be said. The members of parliament stood for an hour, um, a minute of silence. Goebbels also records that because it happened only a couple of days after his cynical remark about the English and the Americans. Uh, but his take on that is, well, this just proves how Jewish in bearing and education and manner and so on, Anthony Eden really is. Which of course to anyone who knows the record, you know, my first memory, because I grew up in England, of a British Prime Minister was Anthony Eden at the time of the Suez War. Uh, but uh, although he was supposedly allied with Israel, um, even then it was how painful it must have been for him. Uh, the, the record of Eden speaks for itself in World War II. I mean, there's so many, so many historians have commented on this, and th there's now a very substantial literature. But his own private secretary <coughs> summed it up. He said, Anthony prefers Arabs to Jews. There was nothing to be done about that. But his anti-Zionism, as we would say today, was rock solid. Nothing could penetrate it. And when it came to saving the Jews of Europe, or rescue plans, or even suggestions from the Americans, who, as we know, hardly went out of their way. Nevertheless, here and there, there were suggestions that were made, as in 1943. How about doing something for the Jews of Southeast Europe, perhaps facilitating uh, some kind of deal regarding uh, Palestine. Eden, so-called Jewish Eden, who was really very aristocratic, uh, kind of anti-Semite of the upper class mold, um, sophisticated. Uh, Eden came out with the usual guff, yeah, if you're familiar with that British term. He pointed to transportation difficulties, military complications, the fact that if, just imagine if the Jews would then get it into their heads that they might suggest deals for the Jews of Poland in 1943. 
or Romania. The implications, frightening. And then if that wasn't enough, Hitler might actually go back on his uh, annihilation program. He might go back to the emigration plans. And then where will we be? We don't have the shipping. We don't have the, dem we don't have the transportation to deal with this. And others have pointed out the numbers just of Germans, prisoners of war, who were being transported across the Atlantic. Hundreds of thousands. They didn't have the transportation for the Jews. So on the one hand, we have the Nazis who think that Eden, like Churchill, is another school man of the Jews. And then we have Eden doing his damn best to delay, to uh, extricate his country from any embarrassing responsibilities. And of course, this was the story to a considerable degree during the wartime years of the Roosevelt administration. And I'm quite sure others will go into this in far more detail than I need to do. But nevertheless, a few remarks are in order. And I think that Alexander Groff um, deserves credit, really, for having drawn our attention more closely to the fact that, as with Churchill, so with Roosevelt, when you look at the vast number of addresses that were made, really, from 19... 33 onwards, but let's just focus on the war years, the press conferences, the statements, and of course the actions. You look at the record of both of these two great allied leaders, no one will contest their immense contribution to mobilizing the Western allies and the immensity of the burden that they had to face. So it's not a question of seeking in any way to diminish their stature as such, but we have to be as clear as possible that about what they did not do that perhaps they could have done. Now, I don't want to get into that whole, that's not my area of expertise. I've read the debates, fascinating as they are, some of them conducted in the Israeli Journal of Foreign Affairs more recently. Um, so I'm not going to get into that. But what I do think is clear is that when a man of Roosevelt's stature, who after all was not an anti-Semite in the sense of uh, what generally today we would understand it as, I think he was very much of a kind of cultural anti-Semite in terms of the times, the milieu he came from, attrition, wasp, east coast, um, but that didn't stop him having many Jewish advisors and friends. It's nothing remotely parallel uh, to Hitler and the Nazis. Nevertheless, the complete indifference to this issue still seems stunning. As in the case of Churchill, Churchill the man who symbolizes resistance to Nazism, and certainly in the British establishment, stood alone in the 1930s, warning about the danger from these gangsters and barbarians in Berlin. We know that. And yet Churchill, too, like Roosevelt, has nothing to say of any significance 
throughout the entire wartime period. And then, as was recently pointed out, in his famous history, written after World War II, between 1948 and 1953, the multi-volume history that runs to more than 3,000 pages about World War II, of which he was such a central participant. In the text itself, there is not a single reference to what today we call the Holocaust or anything connected with the Jews. How is that possible? This is mind-boggling. It's staggering. If the leader of the French National Front in the late 1980s, Jean-Marie Le Pen, could be attacked, as he was, relentlessly even to this day, for having said that what happened to the Jews in World War II was just a detail, un petit détail, dans l'histoire de la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. Well, Winston Churchill, the heroic Churchill, didn't even consider it un petit détail. This is, if we want to be charitable, a stunning case of amnesia. It certainly raises questions. And this from a friend, a friend of the Jews, some people would say a passionate Zionist, others would question that, but certainly a Zionist of a kind, sometimes quite enthusiastic. This is so problematic. And we have to face the really terrifying reality that on the one hand, we have a Hitler surrounded by his entourage, totally dedicated, certainly from 1941, to the mass annihilation of the Jews of Europe, single-mindedly, relentlessly, mobilizing German resources, the resources of Europe, and all these collaborators and allies in this goal. And on the other hand, we have people whose determination certainly to bring him down cannot be questioned, but for whom this same question of the Jews is so totally marginal, something to be avoided, embarrassing, awkward, And this brings me, this brings me to Stalin. In a way, although he was part, very much so, of the allied configuration, the big three as they called them in those days, the strange alliance, but the indispensable one, without which Hitler could never have been defeated, most probably. Let's begin with some of the more positive facts. <coughs> There's no question, I think all historians of the Second World War would agree, that it was the Red Army under Stalin's leadership. It was very much involved, despite the atrocious mistakes that he made early on. And his almost unbelievable trust and confidence that Hitler was a man of his word, who would never attack the USSR. Once Stalin recovers, 
<coughs> he is intensely involved. The Red Army unquestionably breaks the back of the German military juggernaut. There's no comparison, I won't go through it now because it's not really relevant to our issue directly, but the number of divisions at any point after June 1941 that the Wehrmacht had to face on the Eastern Front were incomparably larger. And certainly in the, in the early phase, before the Allies get a foothold in Europe, they are facing very light forces in comparison. Germany has to fight this war essentially on the Eastern Front, and its casualties are huge from the beginning, as, of course, are the Russian, Soviet ones. From a Jewish perspective, there's, of course, a great significance in this. The Western Allies are always saying, in response to Jewish pressure and requests for help, assistance of some kind, there's only one way to win the war. And nothing else really should interfere with that. I won't go into what I think is a very feeble rationalization, even though it had some truth. Obviously, it had some truth. Because it, it's not one or the other, 100% of this and zero of that. Of course, you have to win the war. Of course, that's the priority. It doesn't mean that everything else has to be ignored. But let that go. Because the Soviet armies are the ones that are fighting the Germans in huge battles, never seen before in the history of the world, in areas where, of course, the Jewish populations have been concentrated, Eastern Europe, and on the territory of the Soviet Union. In terms of winning the war and saving the Jews, the advance of the Red Army is important. I wouldn't be standing here today if that were not so. My parents were Polish refugees who fled on the first day of the war from Krakow, eastwards. And from that point on, they found themselves under Soviet rule for the next seven years. And I was born in Kazakhstan. And I'm only here today because the Germans never were able to defeat the Red Army at Stalingrad. That was the single most important battle of World War II. There were many important battles. But that really was the turning point. With all due credit to El Alamein, and it was important, Stalingrad. And then the greatest tank battle in history, of course, 1943. So that's why I'm here today. And of course, if anyone familiar just a little bit with the history of Stalinism, the bitter ironies are almost endless. And of course, the Red Army liberated the death camps in the East. So there is that connection between the remnant of the Jewish people that survives the Nazi Holocaust in the East and the Red Armies who liberate them, but also, and let's not forget because it's very important, a half a million Jewish soldiers serve in the Red Army, of whom something like 200,000 
are either dead or missing, which is a staggering casualty rate. Tremendous. But they fought like lions. And that's, I believe, the largest percentage in any Allied army. There were important Jewish contributions in the British and American armies, but not on that scale. There were 50, so I understand, 50 Jewish generals in the Soviet armies in World War II. And that, despite the great purges, Stalin, who had cut off the leadership of the Red Army in 1936-38. And there were many Jews among the most illustrious casualties of that action, which, of course, had devastating consequences for a number of years for the performance of the Red Army, as we can see what happened in Finland, or we can see in the early phases of World War II faced with Nazi Germany. But despite that, and three of the top nine generals who were purged, executed by Stalin, were Jews, including Yakir. They were all rehabilitated later. Of course, they were framed, just as Tukhachevsky was framed. So the Jews in, in in those armies, in the Red Army. Of course, Stalin, and here's part of the problem with Stalin and the Jews in, in comparison with Churchill and Roosevelt, totally different systems, very hard to compare. Um, Stalin unquestionably really was an anti semite But having said that, well, I haven't said very much. What kind of an anti semite Very hard to define. So many apparent contradictions. I will go back into his history as an early Marxist theoretician and what he wrote about the Jews, although it's interesting. But I will start where I think we can't avoid starting in his struggle for power in the 1920s. His leading opponent was, of course, Leon Trotsky, Leon Davidovich Bronstein Trotsky. And undoubtedly, in a more clandestine way, because in a Marxist-Lenin system, you couldn't be seen. Stalin knew that. He was very careful. He couldn't be seen to be openly anti-Semitic. But there was a campaign. Trotsky, of course, realized it and wrote about it. And then against uh, Kamenev and Zinoviev and others. Undoubtedly, there was an accumulation of hatred. There was a fanatical hatred of Trotsky and Trotskyites in Stalin, which alone can explain why in the Lubyanka they had like three floors devoted to just how can we assassinate Trotsky. They finally got to him in Mexico City in 1940. We know, therefore, Stalin had this bottled up in himself, but he disguised it. And sometimes his way of disguising it was to show the world from time to time how much he's against anti-Semitism. Thus we have a statement of Joseph Stalin in 1931 to the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, the American Jewish Telegraphic Agency, denouncing anti-Semitism as something that no good communist can possibly support as a danger to the Soviet regime, as a relic of the age of cannibalism. Obviously, this was carefully weighed. This is the way Stalin wanted to be seen at that point. 
But when we get to the purges, although some historians either are not sure or perhaps would dispute it, what we see is that Jews are prominently targeted. They're not singled out. The time is not yet ripe for what will happen 10 years later. In 1938, when they had the great show trials, the Bukhari, Rosengold's show trial, 13 of the 18 major accused are Jews. And how, what kind of Jews? How are they being presented? Again, there's a kind of disguise all the time in order to avoid the obvious charge of anti-Semitism. But they are presented as old Bolsheviks who sold out their country, the Soviet fatherland, to the Gestapo, shamelessly, to the worst enemies of the Jewish people. That isn't, of course, said, but that's what everyone would understand. These, these worthless spies wreckers, saboteurs, traitors, the whole well-known vituperative vocabulary of Stalinism. These worthless scoundrels, old Bolsheviks, they're in league with, they are serving the Gestapo and the Japanese imperialists as well. Uh, Trotsky, by the way, by then fully alert to all these things and having been in exile, hounded, harassed, and waging his own war against the Stalinist propaganda machine, he denounces this as anti-Semitism and he is attacked, including in Jewish circles in the United States, very severely for doing this. How dare he accuse, you know, the great farmland of socialism of, of these things. But I think he saw the reality as it was. And of course, he himself and his son, the Onsetov, were sentenced to death in absentia in 1938. And people like Kamenev, Zinoviev, Radek, and others, they were all executed. So it wasn't only Jews, and we're talking about the purges, a million people, I mean. But there was a message there. And I think part of that message was intended for Adolf Hitler. Because what we are seeing here is a build-up to what takes place in August 1939 the molotov ribbon trop non-aggression, so-called non-aggression, pact, which actually was almost immediately followed, as you all know, by the division of Poland, its elimination from the map, so much for non-aggression. And, of course, uh, Baltic states, Bessarabia, Stalin was positioning himself to do business with Adolf Hitler. And what is intriguing, it's the one time that I'm aware of, when you look at the Nazi ideology, this period of 1939 to 41, of the Nazi-Soviet pact which had it been maintained, frankly, I don't see how the control, the German control of Europe could ever have been undone. But it wasn't. And Hitler broke it. Stalin was ready to be faithful to the end, to his side of the bargain. And what happens has significant implications for the Jews. First of all, in Soviet media propaganda, 
all references from that point on to Nazi persecution of Jews stopped. They had reported, particularly in 1938, when Germany annexes Austria and the Sudetenland, and Kristallnacht occurs, even in Pravda, for once, once only, they drew a connection between the pillaging and the plunder in Berlin of Jewish shops and the persecution of Jews and the threat of Lebensraum German expansionism. It's the only time they drew that parallel before the Nazi invasion of the USSR. But then silence, which of course is dramatic for the Jews living on Soviet territory who have no real access or knowledge of what awaits them of what has been happening since the outbreak of the war in terms of what the Nazis are doing in Eastern Europe. And of course the Soviet foreign minister through the 30s, who himself was a Jew, Maxim Litvinov, who actually was quite close to Stalin, which is another side of Stalin's complex persona. You know. Litvinov has to be dropped, is dropped, in order for the Nazi-Soviet pact to be signed. You couldn't have a, a Soviet Jewish foreign minister. A Molotov replaces him. Interestingly, Litvinov is not executed. He's kept a shrewd move, as it turned out. He's kept it in reserve and later reappears in the middle of the war as the Soviet ambassador to Washington. Of course, for Stalin, there are, there are Jews and Jews. Let's not forget, on the one hand, there were the Trotskys and the traitors and wreckers and saboteurs whom he executed, so-called, of course. On the other hand, there were the Jewish Stalins. There were the people around him. The most faithful Stalinist of them all, Lazar Kaganovich. Unforgettable Kaganovich, who lived to the ripe old age of 98, and who Molotov once described, and he should, have he should know, as a 200% Stalinist. This illiterate cobbler's son, he was the kind of Jew that Stalin liked. He took a real fondness to Kaganovich, who was as brutal and auxiliary as they come, and who had real power, especially in the 1930s. And there were others of that type. So here we have Stalin, who is then finding himself, after June 1941, allied to those capitalist thieves whom he has always loathed, like Roosevelt and Churchill. Imagine Stalin really trusting Churchill in the way that he trusted Adolf Hitler. And this was, this was mutual. Hitler, despite his ravings and rantings throughout his entire career against Judeo-Bolshevism as the most satanic, perfidious plot against mankind, Hitler was full of praise for Stalin. He compared him to Genghis Khan. And that's the highest compliment that Hitler could have given to anyone. Let me then conclude. So I want to leave a, mo a few moments for questions. Perhaps by the most extraordinary paradox of all, that 
Stalin, who was ultimately Hitler's conqueror, perhaps more than any other single individual, although he could not have done it without the British and Americans and vice versa. Let's make that clear. Russia alone also couldn't have done it. Hitler's conqueror becomes, within only a few years, his most faithful and, I would say, studious pupil in relation to the Jewish question. And this is the fate, of course, of Soviet Jewry. But even that is complex because the same Stalin who initiates his anti-Semitic campaign from 1947-48 onwards until his merciful death on Purim, 1953. Yes, it happened on Purim. Uh, that same Stalin is the godfather, quote unquote, with all that that means, of the state of Israel. 